our LinkedIn feed. Um, this meeting is being recorded. So if you do want to keep your camera off, if you don't want to be recorded or anything like that, or you just want to sit there and, and listen, um, but we'd love you to get involved, ask questions. You know, we, we want as much interaction as, as possible when we get to our question and answer session. Today's session is going to, we're going to start off with a branch update. We're going to go into um, our main section of it, which is a talk from Abby and then a talk from Kevin. And then after that, there'll be a short question and answer session. And then we'll have a, a close about quarter to two. But if anyone wants to stay on it, wants to ask the committee or anything, uh, or if there's anything you, know, you want to ask us after that, uh, we'll stay on for another 10, 15 minutes after that. So some branch updates. So we did hold a um, strategy strategy session. It's e not, not easy to say when you're trying to get that out. <laughs> um, and we went through, we've got some new objectives for the next 12 months. And we've also got some focus areas that we're looking at, which involve engagement, events planning, membership, professional support, and the future of the profession. So keep an eye out on LinkedIn, because there'll be more stuff coming out about uh, what we're doing as a branch and how you can get involved and how we'll try support our members over the coming uh, 12 months. Um, council updates. So there is now a, an opportunity to connect with council members, ask questions on a monthly basis. Um, the next one coming up is the 22nd of July. Um, there is the meeting registration, the links there. So what I'll do with these um, slides is I'll put these on our LinkedIn page. So if you wanna get that link, will be there for you to use. The next one after that is in August. It's a great opportunity for you to be able to ask questions um, and put your thoughts um, to the council members um, so that it's an opportunity to, to get your um, thoughts heard. And this is the first event of the Back to Basics sessions for this summer. Um, so after last year's great um, Back to Basics part one, we're now part two. Um, so we've got this one as our first one, then we move on to policy, fire, work environment and ergonomics, CDM, accident investigation, and then we plan a field trip to Cranfield in September. And then in the fourth quarter of this year, we've got a few other ideas that we're just putting in place. And you'll hear more about progressing through the grades, academic presentation from university students and a legal update which we do every December. So you'll see that coming up soon. And if you do want um, to get in touch with us or you want to find out what's going on, we're quite um, busy on our socials, so whether that be um, our mailer, whether it be on Twitter, whether it be on LinkedIn, um, or whether it be on our microsite on IOSH, all of the information is there for you to get hold of. And if you want to get in touch with us, uh, that's our email address um, or if you want to get in touch with any of the committee, um, there's quite a few of us on the call today, me, Melissa, Lee, Kevin, um, Alan, Maria, um, we're all on, Asher Rose on as well. So if you do want to get in touch, um, I've used that or get us on, on LinkedIn or, um, or anywhere. Or, or if you want to come along to one of our committee meetings, um, just get in touch and we'll go from there. We're going to finish this little bit just with a, a short poll question. Um, so Paul, you can uh, launch the poll. It's just to find out um, who we've got on today, whether we've got our children branch members or whether we've got people who are from outside the branch. Um, it's always good to find out who we've got coming along. It's, uh, it's great to see so many of you here. Okay, yep. that's a couple of people just to Great. We don't, so we'll end the poll there. That's okay. We'll the there, so, do you want um, to share the results on screen, Luke? Yeah, yeah, share the results, yeah. Okay. okay. So, uh, yeah, so we can see that seven of the people here are um, Chilton Branch, 20 non-members of Chilton Branch. Which is, which is great. It's great to see so many people here. And it's also great because you get the opportunity to listen to Abby Taylor and 
also to uh, Kevin. Um, so I'm going to hand over to you, Abby. Um, if you want to do a little introduction to yourself and then... Yeah, so uh, my name's Abby, as Luke said. Um, some of you have probably met my dad or seen him speak for Jason Anker, um, where he shares his story of his workplace accident, um, which is coming up to 30 years ago, where he chose to work unsafely, um, took a shortcut and ultimately ended up in a wheelchair. Um, he travels the country uh, sharing the story of how it affected himself um, and that of his family and friends and me and my brother, Sam. Um, most people have heard of a ripple effect, um, how many people it affects and who it affects, but um, not many people sort of realise and understand um, how long it lasts for. Um, I was three years old when dad had his accident um, and I can't really remember a time that I can't remember dad not being in a wheelchair. Um, from being young, all I can sort of remember is visiting him in and out of hospital and spending a lot of time with my grandparents and my auntie. Um, and during dad's talks, he sort of shares his experiences of things he missed out on as a dad. Um, the big moments was learning how to ride a bike, um, just general dad duties, parent duties that he couldn't really do. And I know he has endless guilt about that. Um, but dad being in a wheelchair was never something we spoke about growing up. Like it just wasn't a topic. Um, until I was a lot older, I didn't even know what had happened to my dad. It was just the way dad used to act and his moods that it just was never a topic to talk about. Um, which was really difficult growing up, um, in all honesty. Um, when I was a teenager, um, went to secondary school. Um, obviously started having different friends and wanted more of a social life um, but dad's anxiety and dark moods made it really hard to live with and um, he'd just swing off if I asked even just to go to a party or anything um, and it actually resulted in me moving um, to live with my mom um, something I really didn't want to do because I'd lived with dad my whole life um, from what I remembered and but he was just that hard to live with um, when he started to deal with his accident and being in a wheelchair, things did get better. Um, and we got our relationship back on track. Um, but looking back, obviously, Dad was just struggling. He was struggling with being in a wheelchair, being disabled. Um, but mental health just wasn't talked about back then. No one really knew what it was. And if they did, it just was a sort of a taboo subject. Um, and it wasn't until I first watched Dad talk in 2009 I went down to London with him to see what he'd started to do that I actually understood exactly what he'd been through um, and what he's still going through and I, it was really hard for me uh, to be honest it, it took a while to actually even hear everything because I got that upset during the first few I watched and even now when I watch him I still really struggle to hear some of the things just his daily routine and things like that I struggle to listen to it um, but a couple of examples where we're still affected. Um, a big one for us was my wedding day, um, which is seven years ago now. Um, and just planning the whole wedding around Dad's chair when I was going to look at the venue, um, arranging the day, we just had to sort of plan it around Dad. Um, I mean, I was just thankful Dad was there with me on my wedding day. Um, but of course, many tears were shared. Um, he wheeled me down the aisle, he caught my dress a few times. Um, but again, we could understand why it was so emotional for everyone else that was there. Um, and also we got married in Scotland and we did some uh, Scottish Cayley dancing for the evening entertainment. Um, but because dad in the wheelchair and the way it is, dad wasn't part of that. Um, and even now I just had guilt that he couldn't take part. He was fine and he was happy that he was there. But when I look back at the wedding photos and that, it, it bothers me and it's it's all them little moments every time we're planning something and if dad can't be a part of it or dad can't come because of the chair that's just that's just anxiety for me and guilt for me and then back on dad as well because he knows it's bothering me um but it's just not even the big events it's the everyday little planning going sh food shopping going 
out for food or a, a drink, anything. You have to plan it around dad's chair and you'll be very surprised or not. But the amount of times even in today that we get turned away from places because the steps getting in or we'll have to go through the fire exit and round past the dustbins and stuff. And it, it hurts. It, it does hurt. And I know dad puts on a brave face, but it's, it's just not very, it's just not nice. Um, but again, you think you've dealt and overcome all these situations that comes our way and but you just get tested again. Um, and Oh my God, I'm going to get emotional. I didn't think I'd cry because dad's not here. But um, when I had, oh God, when I had my first daughter, Elle, she, she's coming up to be five. <laughs> oh God, I'm sorry. Oh God, I'll get it together. <laughs> um, we soon realised that everything... I had missed out on and dad had missed out on as a dad. He was now missing out on as a grandparent. And she's been affected by something her granddad did nearly 30 years ago. And it's it's ju and it just doesn't end. It so it sort of got better now. She's more um independent. She goes for sleepovers and my dad's fantastic and they have a really good relationship and I have a second daughter and when Tessa was born it happened all over again he can't because of his balance in his chair he can't pick them up he can't they crawl to him when he gets there and he can't physically pick them up and it's and those small moments we all take for granted and to be fair I, I think I still get emotional because I know it hurts my dad and there's nothing any of us can do for the ripples just forever and as dad gets older we're going to, just going to face different hurdles and it's just it just doesn't end um I mean dad has got a lot better since he's practiced his mental well-being and gratitude things he concentrates on what he can do rather than he can't um which is absolutely amazing but we've it does ease everything for us it's made it it's made our lives a lot better we don't worry as much um Definitely my daily anxiety is a lot less. Um, but I do this and put myself through it because I believe that if people realise that just any justification someone uses to work on safely, whether it's job pressure, peer pressure, the rush to get home, which in Dad's case it was, he was literally rushing to watch Nottingham Forest play in the cup final. Nothing is more important than going home safely. Um, you might be willing to risk it for yourself, but it's your family and friends. We're the ones that are directly impacted always. Um, I just wish dad had done that or someone there had, had said no, like stop working. He shouldn't have been on site that day for one, he was hung over. And I just wish someone would have done that for us, for my dad or even dad do it. Um, and it's just to be brave. I mean, even, and listen to that gut instinct I think quite a lot of stigma around safety is if you say something, people go, oh, the safety police are here and things like that. But it shouldn't be that. I would rather I would rather say something and some than not say something and something happens to somebody. Because I'd be more scared of having to say to a family or friend member that I didn't speak up and they were hurt or even killed. Um so yeah, just work safe and speak up for everyone. There's there's nothing it's so simple, <laughs> but it can stop this from happening to any other family. So that's that's my story. It's, uh, it's amazing, Abby. It's, it's amazing how much it affects, you know, not only the person who's had the accident and that, that culture um, <laughs> of getting stuff done and getting it done quickly and finishing work, but how much it affects the family not only you know, 30 years later yeah and you know you can see how emotional it gets you uh, honestly I think every time I think I'm not going to cry today I think it's as soon as I start to talk about the girls I think anyone can relate to having children or yeah. grandchildren or niece and nephews there's just a different feeling around it isn't there and it yeah it's just something that doesn't end and I, 
yeah, I'm glad I've been able to share it with you all today. Thank, yeah, thank you so much for sharing that with us today, Abby. Um, Welcome. And I, I, I really wanted to have you on at the start of this session to show people why having a good safety culture is so important. important. Yeah. Because the impact when it goes wrong. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And just having the culture there that if someone does speak up that they're listened to. Yeah. which is equally important because if they don't feel like they're going to be listened to, they won't say anything. No, they'll keep quiet. Mm -hmm. 100%. Can I ask you a quick question, if that's okay? Yeah. Um, thank you for sharing your story there, Abby. Uh, my name's Rhys. I work for Fourth Ports uh, up in Scotland, right. and we're actually using your father's story as part of our safety stand-down that's currently ongoing today. Uh, it, was, it did hit hard for a lot of people, and it did get the message across on working safely. There was a few yeah. questions that was asked. In terms of his accident, did the ladder slip out from underneath him? or? Yeah, so the ground conditions were really bad. It was January, so it's quite icy. Um, it was actually being footed initially, and he'd come down, but then the guy stepped away and he'd gone been called back up the ladder. Yeah. Um, and then it was yeah, it slipped. Right. But okay. there was no. nothing, yeah, there was nothing that was holding it at the time. Right. Thank you for that. I it was just yeah. it was a few people who were, were interested in wanting to know just but it did hit them hard in this and when they saw the ripple effect video today. Thank you. So um we'll hand over to um Kevin now and he will um he will show you what you can do in practical terms of putting in a health and safety culture. Um, so I'll hand over to uh, Kevin. Thanks, Abby. You're welcome. Hi, everyone. I'm, I'm Kevin Barr. I am I'm a member of the IOS Children Committee as well. Um, I also work for a company called Group Metropolitan who work in sort of ME, fit out, construction related work as well um, and anyone who does work in any construction or construction related fields knows that culture is something that's improving quite greatly but it's not something but it's something that still requires a lot of focus and um, whether it's around caring about mental health about how people can feel confident in reporting um, accidents or issues around sites or not looking at dangerous work environments and accepting them as just being a part of the job that you sort of you know you need to accept these high level risks when it's just not true. Um, I did send the slides to Luke, but I think it might be easier if you, um, I don't know if you, if you want to, if I can, I'm not sure if I can share my screen to be fair, it might be easier just me to, uh, so, I am the head of HSAQ at this company. Um, and when I was originally brought on just a year ago now and, and in my journey before that, I've done a lot of work with, with, with companies, especially in m and construction around safety, culture, improvement programs. Um, and this is the, the slide deck effectively that I use when approaching boards and directors and other senior leaders, that we need to make this change, how we can make this change and what safety culture looks like in a business. Um, so hopefully we will be able to, I will be able to communicate a bit of understanding around how you can go to your own companies and your own businesses and hopefully put that case together that this is a requirement and, and practical steps to actually getting it, it done. I will not go through the slides, slides word for word, um, they just exist, um, but just to people really understand the, the technical points of a safety culture. Um, in its simplistic terms, it can be very, very complicated, but it's effectively what the company's shared values are, what company believes is important and how they believe things work. And, and the key word with safety culture and culture in general is it's the way we do things around here. It is the, the default setting. It's how people accept things are done within a business. And if people accept that people are not going to wear PPE or people accept that they're not going to be listened to when they report health and safety concerns, that's a, cult, that's, that's a poor health and safety culture. That's a culture that's, that's allowing these things to happen. And effectively um, encouraging them to happen. This does not belong to me. I always like to make that clear. It's called the Dew Point Bradley Curve. Um, I'm a very big fan of it. I think it's a great educational piece when you're talking to people in senior positions or anyone that you're trying to convince of these things. It was a study that was done and it talks about the different types and levels of culture within a business, reactive culture, dependent culture, in 
dependent culture and interdependent culture and how as you move through these stages towards in an interdependent culture the likelihood of risks lowers but the productivity within a business operational and value generation and operational discipline increases so there is a direct com com correlation between a good safety culture and a good business culture and the productivity and value that a, that a company has commercially. Um, so starting at the very beginning, thinking reactive, and I'm sure many of you, if you're not working in a business like this now, probably have at some point in your life. Employees are not part of the problem, uh, are part of the problem, they're not a part of the solution. Employees are not, or, or managers at any level, feel any responsibility for safety or any commitment towards it. And bad luck is widely believed to be the main factor behind accidents. And accidents take place, remedial action is taken afterwards through hurried measures, but no one addresses the root cause of the problem. These companies will typically not have health and safety managers, um, or they've given it to an operational person to manage, but it's all reactive. It is something goes wrong, we need, to, we need to deal with it now. And then the same things will just keep happening over and over and over again. People are the cause of accidents, not environments and not cultures. Hopefully with the going to the further steps down through my slide, you move on to a dependent culture where it's based on overseers. Most companies will be at this stage when they hire their first proper health and safety manager um, or start what, reaching out to consultants to manage this for them. Employees are still not still a part of the problem, not the solution, but there is an, now an appoint, appointed person who's in charge of safety. And this person is that everything to do with health and safety due to them. If you go to a manager and say, who's responsible for health and safety? And their response is the health and safety manager and not myself you are in a dependent system. It's purely dependent on one technical expert or one individual to manage health and safety across the entire business. Accident rates will decrease, um, but it's still believed that injuries are happening because rules are disregarded or you, know, you put policy and process in place and people aren't following it, so it's still their fault. If they had just done as they were told, accidents wouldn't happen. Going into independent, it's based on self-protection. And this is the level where I think most Decent companies get to. Interdependent can be a difficult one to achieve at the final level. But employees are part of the solution, not part of the problem. We involve people at every level in taking personal responsibility for safety within the business. Everyone understands that from the employee all the way to the director and everyone in between is equally responsible within their scope and level of responsibility for safety and health and the well-being of themselves and those around them. Um, accidents rates will decrease further. Um, it's believed that injuries happen because of a lack of self-protection. So there's still this thought process that I am to blame completely for accidents instead of the com combination that accidents happen for many, many reasons. And although they are almost always directly caused by an action or inaction by an individual, they are not caused solely by them. The root cause is almost never going to be based on an individual's actions or action. The goal is interdependent health and safety culture. Employees are the solution. Employees and managers every relate to collective responsibility of safety um, as a team. Safety is regarded as a part of the workload and risk taking is not accepted from any team member. It's built into budgets. It's built into the plan. When we're planning a project, it's not, okay, well, let's focus on the commercial elements and let's focus on the actual getting the job done. Health and safety is at every point of that. What budget do we need for safety? What tools are we going to need? How are we going to get that done safely? If we've got lifting equipment in, what are the Lola regs saying? What type of technical experts do we need to make sure things are done safely? Do we have enough resource and welfare on site? It's just a part of the discussion that's happening at every level. And communication and training involvement are key to improving safety. It's accepted that everyone needs to have some sort of health and safety training. It's not just for the managers. Employees need it. Managers need it. Directors need it. Your admin staff, if you can get away with it, probably could do with some training on health and safety, even if it's maybe more office-based. And injury, injuries at work are not acceptable. There's a serious commitment to achieve zero accidents within the organization, and you see the actual work going in to have that happen. So it all sounds great. This is where you want to move to. This is what you want to see at the different levels of a health and safety culture. But how do you actually go about doing that? Now, this is how, how I sell it. And this is how I do it. There are many, many different ways of doing this. And I would say to everybody who hasn't either put the, you know, the years of research and, and, and training courses that I've been into to get this done, look for an external consultant. There are so many really good, great experts out there. 
that will come into a company and you know work with you and talk with you and figure out how as a company you can start moving towards a better safety culture it's um it can be simple when you know what you're doing and very very time consuming to go down the wrong the wrong routes but for me i talk about finding your kips your key influencing points this is the graph that i use here so safety culture cannot be directly influenced culture in general can't be directly influenced but it is influenced by things that go on in your business, your attitudes, behavior, organizational structure, and the sustainability model of your business. Um, all of those things are then impacted again by work environment, communication, management systems, and people. These things themselves can also not be always directly influenced, but there are parts that make up these different aspects. And they're sort of scattered around the graph that you can see here. And uh, I, can, I can send this, this image out to anyone who requests it. Things like job satisfaction, motivation, commitment, background, management and supervision, visibility, leadership, procedures, monitoring, fair blame, uh, consistency, honesty, reporting. Um, I've been meaning to add trust to that one there, but it's sort of linked into something else because trust is a big one and how that looks. These are all actionable things specific things, key influencing points that you can target for improvement to have this filter in effect where it links into, you know, procedures and risk assessments and rules and goal setting links into a good management system. And as you improve those things, your management system improves, which improves your organizational structure and sustainability of your business, which then improves your safety culture. So you want to be trying to target things from, from different angles. So I would complete a cultural, uh, cultural progress analysis um, which is a completely different street I do. And it goes through each and every single one of these points, qualitative assessment of what, how we're doing, what we're doing, and what we can do to improve those areas so that we can create a, an assessment of what priority areas we need to look at. If we know that management supervision is great, not likely, but it could be great, but we don't define our roles very well for organizational structure. And with people, then that's something that we can we can resolve. We, we can say, you know what, this is a priority. We do this really poorly. Let's try and get this sorted for a nice, easy win. And something can be a lot more complicated, especially around honesty and reporting. But once again, they can be targeted. And that's when you get into targeted initiatives. You can't change culture directly, but you can target the things for improvement that influence culture. These are examples, and I'm not going to go through them. Um, because otherwise I'll be talking away forever and I, I can't see a clock, so I actually have no idea how long I've been talking for. Um, but these are examples here, and once again, I can send this out to you, uh, of, of my own experience of ways in which you can improve the working environment, communication, um, and specific areas in which can be targeted around people. People's are good ones. So a new starter joins the company and goes through a great onboarding process. Health and safety is a key topic, and they head into their first day with a safety mindset. But less than an hour into the shift, they're laughed at for wearing their PPE over their workmates, real example. At the end of the shift, they get told they need to pick up their pace by a supervisor. The next day, to save time and face, they ignore their PPE, rush to the job and ignoring health and safety, and it's accepted. So it made no difference that culturally you're telling you've got a great onboarding process, but once they actually get out of sight, if the supervision and the, the, the way that work is being done and the way things are done around here doesn't reflect your onboarding process it's going to make make no difference and it's going to cause problems with you culturally but if you know that's an issue you can target that as a problem and try and reprove it we'll just get through these ones quickly it's got a few of them and then you've got your going forward so you, you you understand where your problem areas are you've got ideas and actions now that you can target towards improvement how do we go forward from there so once you've got culture to a point where you're happy with, it's a constant ongoing battle. It deteriorates over time and left alone. It's never, you can fix it and then we can look away from it. It requires that constant look ahead. So your culture starts to improve. You get to a point where accidents effectively stop um, or at least culturally related accidents will stop. And you say to yourself, you know, we had a target. We hit our target. We're doing really good. We've got an amazing culture now in the business and it peaks, we can now divert resources somewhere else, which, which, will, which will very likely happen. But it will start to deteriorate. It'll tick down, it'll tick down, it'll tick down, and then you'll have an accident. And then people will look at the accident and they'll do the investigation and you'll say, actually, we fixed this problem months ago, years ago. 
why has this come a problem now? You just can't leave it alone. You have to constantly be reevaluating, and I would do it annually. That's what I do. Reevaluating, going through a, an actual cultural analysis, whether you want to attach it into your standard internal auditing system or do it as a separate audit that's done by somebody with the skills to look at it or hire someone externally to come and look at it. Just to constantly keep picking up on these things and keep pushing forward. Continual improvement is always the key. <laughs> Continual improvement. It's an ever-changing, ever-moving thing. An icon organization needs to consider those changes over time and adapt to them. Your business will grow, your business will change. External influences will change. Um, the Gen Z people will start working for your business and the idea of culture will change again. So we always need to be trying to improve our culture, always aiming to be doing better tomorrow than we did today, constantly looking for ways in which we can improve our culture and then targeting to them, which in itself, creates a continuous improvement culture, which is the best type of culture you can get, especially if you're working with ISOs. And then cultural onboarding. A lot of people talk about onboarding your, uh, your, your day one induction or the, the paperwork effectively fill out in most businesses and then get sent to work on day one with no real cultural onboarding. It's important from the moment that a new person joins your business, especially once your culture's in a good place, that you're teaching them about your culture and your business, what you expect from them, what your values are. Gosh, I'm going for the next slide. Okay. The mission, the vision, and the values, communicating your vision in a positive, excited manner, you know, making sure that people understand what these are from day one and that you're monitoring and managing these things as well. Um, I went to a great talk with, with, with Bob Cummings the other day, and he talks about values and your mission and your vision and how that links into trust. If you have these things and you're telling people this is how you're going to do things, this is what your culture looks like, but you're not actually doing them and they're not seeing them on the day to day, it creates this break, break of trust. And then that will just spiral your culture down. That could cause a lot of problems. Um, but he also talked, and I, I did like this, that values are great, but you need action, actionable values. It's great to say that your value is trust. What does trust look like in your business and communicate that out to people? and then showcase that culture. If you've got a big potion, your boss says, always health and safety first. I'm sure some of you do. Does health and safety always come first? Probably not. Um, I really hope that it does, and it'd be great if it does. I know my experience, um, the commercial elements and the operational elements come first, and we try and do our best to, to minimize the, the impact on a good health and safety culture and health and safety in the business, whether that's through pushing legislation at them or convincing them that the, the commercial benefits to good health and safety. We're not convincing them that health and safety comes first. We're convincing them that health and safety is a part of their commercial business. So either stand by what your culture is saying and showcase that to the world and everyone that will listen to it, and posts and, and the way that you talk to each other, or change the message to, to really reflect what, what's true about your business. Um, and this is a, is a good one. I didn't have to use it for my current, current employment because they, they actually did very well with retention. But uh, there's a direct correlation between a good safety culture and better retention. I will not go into um, safety psychology or psychological safety and, and how that impacts things. Um, probably sort of take my word on it. That a good safety culture equals better retention. People will stay because they feel cared about. They know that you are doing what you need to do to put the employee first because safe health and safety truly affects the frontline worker as, as, as Abby can, can attest to that. When something goes wrong, yeah, it's a bit annoying that your, your, your employee liability insurance is gonna have to pay out and you might lose 10, 20, 100 grand in compensation and court fees, but a person being in a wheelchair for the rest of their life is the person that's really going to be impacted by poor health and safety culture. And people know that, people recognize that in the employment market. And if they feel unsafe at work, they will go and look somewhere else. So I'll just get onto another slide. I don't know if I've crashed. Yeah, I've crashed. There's no more slides. It just ends with a thank you. But I've, uh, I've crashed somehow. Yeah. Yep, that's crashed. But, um, but thank you very much. That's that's all from me. Thanks, Kevin. That was uh, it was brilliant. Loads of people asking for your slides, Kevin.
I will do. I because I, I, I normally have like five monitors. I'm joking. I have three, um, but I'm working in a corner of an office at the moment um, with my laptop. So as soon as I opened up the slides, I could not see anything. <laughs> no clock. There's no no thing. But yeah, I said if anyone wants to uh, sort of gather up some sort of emails or connections or something, I'm happy to send the slides out. Perfect. Yeah, we've got we've got that in the chat, so we can uh, we can get that get that across to you. Um, so have we have we had any uh, questions, Melissa? Yeah, hi everyone. Um, no, no questions. Everyone has said thanks, um, Abby, for you know sharing that um, very powerful experience. Um, and then everyone's asking for Kevin's slide deck. So I don't know if you wanted to just ask um, people to come off if they wanted to come off camera and maybe sh share anything, um, any examples, you know, um, related to what Kevin has talked about, um, especially that last piece, I think, with the um, correlation between retention and culture. But Ad Alan did say he had something he might want to share from a reg inspector perspective. So maybe Alan first and then others. Okay, Melissa, thank you. And um, Abby, I, I, I put a, you know, a personal comment observation on on you as many others have and, and well done for, <clears throat> for sharing you. your story. It has great impact. Um, and, and Kevin too, for giving us some sort of structure around this. Um, there's another perspective as well. Um, and uh, as an HSE inspector for 30 plus two years, something like that, um, I, I think the impact on, on families and friends and people don't think about the investigators. We may have some colleagues in the police and fire service and so on that, who, you know, turn up at the scene. And, and that's very much the case with inspectors. Um, one of our chaps was turned up at a farm. He had a list of um, files, farms to visit, and a policeman was waiting at the entrance and you know, said, who are you? He said, I'm the health and safety, but okay, carry on. And the guy was still in the machine in the middle of the field. I mean, you know, that that was a very odd coincidence and the impact on on him as a young inspector was, was very, very significant. Um, personally, my breakfast was interrupted. Um, I had to go out to a scene where a, a seven-year-old girl had drowned um, in a grain pit same age as my son at the time and all of those things are are, are really tough so we mustn't uh, forget that too um in, in terms of impact on people working with others um i dealt with a father who took his son's hand off in a machine and and you know that that guilt all of those things that you talked about abby are there yeah. um and it's at that stage people say if only, <laughs> yeah. and it's changing that around, isn't it, to, to the planning, which is which is very much what you're about. And I think sharing those stories is an important part of that process. Yeah. Um, I've also seen uh, the impact on individuals going through to court. I mean, you know, with manslaughter and potential imprisonment now, but um, I've seen cases where, you know, five, six plus years sometimes to get to court and, and individuals have, have aged you know, visibly yeah. in that time, just the fear of what they're facing. Um, so, yeah, I, I was just wanting to give another perspective about the, wide, the wider impact, um, you know, the, you. Uh, the yeah. pressure that is put on people. So thank you for letting me share that. Yeah, thank you. Um, Kevin, we've got a, got a question for you. Um, it's from uh, Ian Broadbridge. Um, what tool can we use in addition to leading and lagging KPIs to benchmark and monitor measure culture? Good question. Um, I reference, I link it into KPIs, and I'm sure anyone that deals with KPIs and, and senior members will, will recognize that what was done, and that was done intentionally so that there can be a bridge in understanding since they, you know, board of directors and CEOs, they love their KPIs. They love things that they can measure and monitor and see. Um, but outside of your leading and lagging um, KPIs, there are um, surveys, um, which I'm a big fan of, and generally just, just asking people whether you're doing it formally and formally um, to try and understand for yourself. So when I do my cultural um, progress analysis, there are surveys, there are documentations, there are things that are a bit more provable, but a large part of it is just me getting out on site, talking to people, understanding where the problems are and what other people see as problems, 
witnessing what's actually going on. So you cannot do a cultural survey from an office. You have to be out on site. You have to monitor things and see things and, and guess you your own experience and the experience of others about where these problems are. And if you can find some way to then hopefully improve those by connecting them back to the, to the other leading and lagging KPIs. Hope that, that that was a good answer. Or you can always follow up if you want to one mic yourself and talk. And Mike, I'm mute. Uh, Ian said, uh, said, great, thank you. Thanks, Kevin. I have a question. Yeah. I was very interested in uh, what Kevin said. I'm, I'm very interested in culture. I just want to thank Abby for a, a great talk. Actually, it was, you know, to me, it always pulls on my heartstrings when I see people talking and also read the HSE bulletins each week. But I am interested where putting the slide up of saying health and safety first. I do a lot of work with businesses which are not financially fantastically well off, but they work in industry where I sometimes get, yes, some of it's low risk, but some of it's high risk, especially for working from height is where one of my, my big issues is because of uh, not every company can afford great mechanical aids to drive lorries underneath like Amazon that you've got people climbing up and they can't, they're trying to pay people's mortgages and keep the business afloat, but don't have an unlimited budget. And that's where reasonably practical, I find sometimes can be a bit gray in, in my job that when I talk to the managing director and say, you can't do that, you need to spend X amount of thousand to sort this and he ain't got it. What does he do? You know, does he shut the business down and say, you know what, I'm, I'm not going to do this anymore. I agree with the health and safety first, but I haven't got the cash to, to correct that problem. Or if I don't do it, I lose the contract. It, it's very difficult for the small business. It's great where I came from working for Wreck-It Van Keys are where it's an unlimited budget. But when it's down to the to the, to the small people in, in the world where they haven't got thousands of pounds, I, it does worry me in, in my role when I sit in my monthly reviews and highlight it that you need to do better and there just isn't the money to do it. It scares me, really. It, it does give me sleepless nights. I know that sounds a bit mm. a bit wrong, but you listen to Abby and it should give me sleepless nights. It should. It's Fall, fall from height is still the number one cause of serious yeah. injury in this country. It needs to be taken seriously. And, and as I said, I work in this industry for one, it does not get taken seriously in a lot of companies. And there's a financial element to it. Everyone has a pair of steps in their van. Not everyone's yeah. going to go out and get a proper platform or go and get plasma trained and get all the correct equipment in place and your iPaths and renting out equipment and making sure it's all done safely. No one's team is big enough to make sure you've got a second person always manning the ground. So they, they, they skip these things. And that's what I was talking about. The, the reality, at least in my experience, and maybe different industries and different people have different experiences, is that the commercial element comes first. And the sooner we accept that as an industry, the better we can start making real change in culture and the way things are done. And you have to have that conversation with them. The truth of a lot of the tenders that I work with, especially when you're looking for bigger contracts, they will expect to see a certain amount of health and safety as well. So when you're working in certain, with, with certain clients, if the client isn't driving that, it can be very difficult from our, per, our perspective to try and drive it as well, because you can't argue that commercial element as much. But it doesn't need to be onerous and it doesn't need to be expensive. But as a health and safety professional, sometimes you do have to put your foot down about some things, remembering you are there in an advisory capacity effectively. If they, want, if they choose to ignore you, there's nothing that you can do about that. Um, but you know, as long as you're the voice of reason, the voice that says, you know what, this isn't safe. And there are simple solutions to that. Um, I regularly hate seeing people using steps for, for working on in roof cavities. Um, a there's perfectly cheap and reasonably affordable platforms that you can buy that are easy to carry around that I prefer to see in most work, work in m and &E a lot than even people having a ladder. And I've seen some crazy, really good um, working at height equipment for long-term working up at height and on ladders, probably four or 500 pound for the, for the equipment once it's there. So some of these things aren't, don't have to be hugely expensive. Um, I was just looking at the, the innovation within the industry and what's available, making sure that they're aware there are these options and make your stance clear when it comes to safety. That yes, yeah, safety may not come first with the company and it's important to, 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 to fit yourself into that, 
But for you as an individual, as a health and safety manager, or working health professional, health and safety does come first to you. And you, and, you know, after these sleepless nights, you can only do what you can do. Um, you know, there are, there are many times I've advised this is the best course of action. We need to do this. I put a business case together and it's just fallen apart. And they said, no, we don't want to do that. And I always give them the same talk. This is as a technical expert, as your trusted advisor, this is what I think we need to do to keep people safe. If you're going to ignore me, that's fine. But you know, there's a record of that being ignored. From a liability point of view, if something goes wrong, this is going to be the fallout and this is going to be the cost to your business. Um, and, and that's that's all you can do. I'm not, at least, at least, unless, unless anyone else can think they think of a better answer. No, that's, 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 10 years. I do, I do, do I put everything in writing, what I say and what to do it, but you just sometimes feel that you're covering your own bum because uh, you, you, you've sort of said it. It, uh, it worries me because one of my businesses, there's 10 guys out going to sites and... Uh, when you're not there to, because I love getting out there and watching and feeling and watching. I always do it right when somebody's watching. When I'm watching, it's perfect. When I walk away, I just sometimes wonder. That's, that's a perfect example of, of, of culture because I, 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 I probably shouldn't do it. I link it to dog training and I'm a big fan of dog training. It's easy to get a dog to do what you want to do when you're telling them what to do and when you're sitting in a kitchen, you've got a treat in your hand. It's a different thing altogether to walk out to the park and expect your dog off lead to behave perfectly. Um, and it's the exact same thing when you get out to, to workplaces. They're always going to be doing what they need to do when you're there. How do you get them to do what you're doing when you're not there? And that's about influencing that culture. And there's no quick fix. There's no, you know what, I'm going to put a poster on the wall and everyone's going to go, you know what, I should be wearing my PPE and I should be being safe and I should use the right tools and I should go out to the van to get the right working at height equipment instead of just standing on a, a random piece of equipment that happens to be nearby that's going to do the same job. But if the culture's not there, they, they're going to do all of those things. And it's about turning around and saying, right, how, you know, asking those questions. Have we educated people? Are we communicating? Is there good leadership and visibility of that leadership? Um, I can't remember who said it now. That's going to annoy me now because I'm going to say it. And if he, if he sees the webinar, he'll probably, probably have a go at me for not, not, not giving his name out. Um, but he was talking about an example where he had a training course go on. There's an, ex an external consultant was doing this training and they intentionally had people outside the front doing unsafe construction work um, to see if any of the directors and, and the senior leadership team would say anything. And it said out of 10 people, two of them said something. Um, and all they did was go into the reception at this conference center and say, you know, you've got people outside, you know, doing this unsafe work just to sort of then highlight to them during the thing that none of them thought to stop anything. So if you've got people, managers going on site, and that includes yourself as well on your site, and you're seeing unsafe things, you're not saying anything, it feeds into that, that leadership and visibility side of, of health and safety. But it can't just come from you, as you say, when you walk away, it'll be a problem. When I go on a site and I see minor unsafe work, if I think someone's about to die, I'm going to stop them straight away. If I see someone doing something something minor, I won't, I, I won't stop them myself. I will go to the site supervisor or the manager on site, and I will bring them back to what's going on and ask them if they see any problems both because I want to have them be the person that stops this work. And as a second part to see if actually maybe the gap might be the site supervisor or manager maybe doesn't have the confidence or the knowledge that that's a part of what they're supposed to be doing to ensure safety on their site. Or even worse, they're expecting me to come to site and be the only person that says anything, which is, which is happens. It's where I am. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, you know, to drive that back with the, with the management and say, it's not your responsibility to come on site and stop all the unsafe work. It's their responsibility to stop it. And if you're coming on site and seeing unsafe work, it's not a problem with the workers. Um, it's the problem with the site management. Why are they not doing something about it before you got here? They knew you were coming. Thank you. Thanks. Cheers. Thank you, Kevin. And uh, thank you, Abby. That's been great. We're going to close it there. Um, if you do have any other questions that come up, um, Send a send a message to us at, at, um, at our Irish Chilton branch, and we can, you know, put them to Kevin and to Abby. Um, I think it's been really really good. It's been great actually having you two uh, together because it shows, you know, how to create that culture and and why those choices that you make, or those choices you give to people in that culture, what that effect can have uh, on the back end of it after an accident. Which is fantastic to uh, to hear from you, Abby. Um, and um, next week we do have um, another back to basic session. So we have our health and safety policy. Um, so be sure to look out on LinkedIn. Uh, all the details are in there. Um, same time next week, same place. Um, and we'll see you then.
Thank you very much to yeah, everyone. Thank you. Bye.